Before we start the sermon this morning, I want to remind you of something that's coming up uh, Tuesday and Wednesday night, and that is our next GBC town meetings. And we had town hall meetings a couple of months ago to present to you the results from the golf group study that we've done. And now the elders want to present to you Tuesday and Wednesday night. It's the same meeting both nights. No need to come one night or both nights, but we'd love for you to come one and hear the vision for the next 10 years from the GBC elders. We're excited about it. We've prayed about it. We've talked a lot about it, and we've uh, made some decisions that we want to share with you, and we're, we're really excited to do that because it talks about our hope for the future and looking forward to what God's going to do here at GBC. And speaking of hope, it was 1977 that I first saw this movie in a theater, and it was called A New Hope. And it was, it was radical. I mean, who's got two moons? But it was all about a new hope and what's going to happen in the future. And I want to remind you that as we read the book of Ruth together, it's all about hope. And I want to remind you again that hope changes everything. You know, if you're in life and you're in a tough scenario, you look for some hope in that situation because it helps you move forward. And if you think there's no hope, we just are down in the dumps and we're depressed. But you see, with the Lord, there's always hope. And hope changes everything. And in the book of Ruth, we see Ruth and her mother-in-law, Naomi, who were moving from a foreign country back into Israel. And they seem to be without hope. But chapter 2, as we look at it today in our story, shows us that there's hope for the future. And before I have Bethany Seidel read our scripture this morning, I want to give you three things right at the very beginning, and I'll repeat these again at the end. First of all, there's no coincidences with God. No such thing. No coincidence. Number two, I am loved by God no matter my condition. So are you. We're loved by God no matter our condition. And number three, Jesus wants to be our Redeemer. Wants to be our Redeemer. That's the backdrop for Ruth chapter 2. Let me open in prayer, and Bethany will read our scripture for today. Lord, we are so excited by these folks who have been baptized today because it testifies that you are their redeemer. Would you help us today as we look at the book of Ruth to understand not only your plan for Ruth and Naomi and Boaz, but your plan for us. Would you help us to understand your word in a new way today as we open it together and be changed by your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The barley harvest was beginning. Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side from the clan of Emelech, a man of standing, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth, the Moabitess, said to Naomi, Let me go into the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, Go ahead, my daughter. So she went out and began to glean in the fields behind the harvesters. And it turned out she found herself working in the field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Lamelech. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they called back. Boaz asked the foreman of his harvesters, Whose young woman is that? The foreman replied, she is the Moabitist who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She went into the field and has worked steadily from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, My daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean from another field, and don't go away from here. Stay here with my servant girls. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the girls. I have told the men not to touch you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She exclaimed, Why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? Boaz replied, 
I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. How you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you do not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have given me comfort and have spoken kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servant girls. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come over here, have some bread, and dip it in the wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to the men. Even if she gathers among the sheaves, do not embarrass her. Rather, pull out some stalks from from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up. And do not rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed the barley she had gathered, and it amounted to about an ephah. She carried it back to town, and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth also brought out the grit and gave her what she had left over, and she had eaten enough. Her mother-in-law asked her, Where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one whose place she had been working. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz she said. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead, she added. That man is our close relative. He is our kinsman redeemer. Then Ruth the Moabitess said, he even said to me, stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all of my grain. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it'll be good for you, my daughter-in-law, to go with these girls, because in someone else's field, you might be harmed. So Ruth stayed close to the servant girls of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvest were finished. And she lived with her mother-in-law. Thank you so much. What a great story we have to look at and continue today. And you know, as we start chapter 2, we meet a new character, a new character. It's Boaz, and I told you last week, and I'll repeat it again, that names, biblical names, have meaning. And in Boaz's case, his name means swift strength, swift strength. One of the writers said that before Boaz met the love of his life, he was ruthless. Okay, I'll leave that right there, and I'll go on to say, really... The most, the most intriguing part is that he's a relative. And you've got to see how the writer stitches this little piece of information right into the first couple of verses. Because the fact that Boaz is a relative will tie into the end of this chapter, this kinsman redeemer idea. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Also, it says Boaz is a man of standing. That means he's got money. That means he's got a great reputation. And it means that he's got a great love for the Lord, which we'll see as we go through there. But the author continues to call Ruth the Moabitess because the author doesn't want us to miss the fact that this woman is an outcast. She has zero standing with the Israelites. She's visually different. They could discriminate against her on sight. And that's what even makes the story even more beautiful as we go through. Ruth takes the initiative. I will go into the fields and glean. I'll go do that, she says to her mother-in-law. And gleaning, gleaning, the idea of gleaning is picking up what's left behind. Now, I need to tell you that what's incredible is that Ruth, the Moabitess, the foreigner, the outcast, she understands the law. She understands the law given to the Israelites by God. She's the one who says, I can go in and I can go pick up the leftovers. The foreigner 
knows God's word. So just for a moment, let me pause and say, do you know God's word? How well do you know it? Because see, Ruth, the foreigner, had a great grasp of the care of God from his word. And let's look at Leviticus 19 so we can see what this gleaning law is about. When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest, the things that were dropped. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. You see, the Israelites, at God's direction, had a plan to take care of the poor. And when they got done with their fields, they could only go through once. And whatever was dropped were there, was there for the poor and the alien. And you see, Ruth qualified on both accounts. She was poor as a widow, and she was an alien as a Moabite. So she volunteers to go to work all by herself. A woman, an outcast, it was a dangerous occupation for her to go into the field. She takes the initiative and she goes alone and she sets out for a field unknown. Can you imagine being in a new place and you're leaving your elderly mother-in-law and you're just going out to work. I'll find work someplace. I mean, literally, she has no idea where she is or where she's going. And I love the way scripture puts this. As it turned out, she ends up in the field of our hero. As it turned out, one of, maybe your translation says, it just so happened. By hap, it just so happens. But there are no coincidences with God. There are none. Boaz, the relative, our leading man, it's his field that Naomi ends up in. And it, what we see as chance many times is really the hand of God working. Let me give you an example. So we sent out a small Haiti team a couple of weeks ago. Remember that? Four, four guys sent down to Haiti. And one of the things that we had up here on stage, right over here, there was a water bucket full of dirty water. If you were here, you remember that? We turned that thing on. It was dripped all the way through while we watched uh, you know, some stuff and Andy was talking. And these are water filters that we were bringing down to Haiti because clear water in Haiti is a problem. And so uh, Andy packed up a dozen of these things, and he and the other three guys went down there. By the way, they finished all the work that they went to do and more. And we're really excited about that. We'll have a report out in a, in a couple of weeks on that. So really, uh, really thanking the Lord and great job by our team. So they get down there, and the weather was terrible. It was like monsoon re uh, weather. And, you know, to get up that mountain where, uh, where we we're helping build this church, they had to go through almost two feet of mud. Two feet of mud. I'm sure we'll get some pictures and stories about that. So they just happened to have these water filters there. So one of the days that they wanted to get up the mountain, they couldn't go. And so it's kind of a day, like, you know, what do we do? And how do we redeem this day? And, and uh, Andy is, evidently shows the water filters to Jephthah's wife, Mitu. And she said, Andy, the orphanage that we support, they have a well that we built, that we drilled, but the water is impure. The girls are getting sick. So Andy takes the, uh, the water filters over there, instructs them on how to put the water filters together, and they start to use these water filters. Now, it just so happened that Andy had attended a conference with Gary a couple of weeks ago, and the guy presenting from this missions group used these filters. Just so happened that Andy talked to the guy and said, hey, tell me about the filters just so happens that Andy buys a dozen of these filters and packs them with him. Just so happens that when we get to Haiti, we've got a day where we can't do anything. Just so happens that there's a whole orphanage of sick girls because they need clean water. Just so happens we happen to have filters that filter a million gallons of water. It just so happens? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? That's God's hand at work. And you see, when Ruth just ends up in the field of Boaz, it's not a happenstance. It's God's direction and movement. Boaz comes in to work in the morning and greets his workers and says, the Lord be with you. Probably just the way it is at your place of work. And all the, work, <laughs> and all the workers answer back, the Lord be with you. Okay. We get the character of Boaz. He loves God and loves others. And I want to submit to you, 
That's the most important thing from God's viewpoint, that we love God and we love others. If we get that right, it, amazing things will happen. And Boaz comes into work and he, and he sees Ruth and he goes, Who is that? And a statement full of meaning, I might add. Because Ruth's name means beautiful companion. Beautiful companion. Does love happen at first sight? Sure it does, just not with my daughters. So, um, and Ruth is referred to again as a Moabitess. She's a foreigner, and so all more amazing that Boaz should take notice of her. And the foreman gives this great reputation, you know, Ruth's reputation, high character, loyal to Naomi. She's worked in the field all day. She started early, and she hasn't stopped until now. She had a great reputation, so I want to pause and just ask, what's yours? What's mine? What's my work reputation? What's my neighborhood reputation? What's my reputation when I play organized sports? Uh-oh. I'm one of the loudest people on the tennis court. Well, never mind, but what's my reputation? I need to be concerned about that, and so do you, because we're ambassadors for Christ. Boaz it goes on and extends grace and protection to Ruth. Stay here, work in my field. He really goes through and breaks down cultural and racial boundaries. So should we. He offers water access to the Moabitess, which was a huge deal. Ruth is amazed and humbled, and she asks this question, Why have I found favor? such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner. Well, why? Because Boaz notices her unselfish love for Naomi, he says in verse 11, and her trust in Yahweh, verse 12, and he was moved to bless her, and he thought she was probably really cute. It's a love story. But you may ask that same question, why does God love me? Can God really love me? I know me better than anybody here. Can God love me? You may be saying the same thing to yourself. What is it? Why would God extend his love to someone like me or you? Well, he created us. He's our father. He longs, Scripture says, to gather us as a mother hen gathers her chicks. And I want to say that God loves us because God is love. 1 John 4 says, Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Earlier, one chapter earlier, it says, How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God and that is what we are. It's amazing. And as Lloyd referred to in his introduction of the baptism today, it's, for it's by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. You see, God loves us because that's who he is. And when he looks toward us, his creation, he feels this incredible love and wants to have relationship for us. Boaz says, may the Lord repay you. He gets it. He understands he's just the facilitator of what God is doing. And Ruth has actually taken refuge, Boaz says, under the wings of God. It's a beautiful um, metaphor for how God spreads his love over his people. And God is providing hope for Ruth's future because he's her place of refuge. Do you know that place of refuge with God? Do you know that there's a place of safety with God? Do you know that you can be fully loved by God? You see, this whole Boaz-Ruth thing is a picture of God's love for us. And it's amazing. Because just like Ruth, we don't deserve it either. Ruth understands her lack of standing. I'm lower. I'm a Moabitess. I'm lower than one of your servants. And see, we're in that same place because our sin separates us from God. We've got no standing either. And just like Ruth needed a redeemer, so do we. So do we. 
You know, it's, it's the reason why we ask when people get baptized, do you know and love the Lord Jesus? Have you accepted his work? Is he your redeemer? Yes, dunk. That's the main thing. We all need a redeemer. Ruth has lunch with the workers. Again, the elevation of her status and a sign of approval. Boaz gives further instructions. Don't mess with this girl. He basically says to his workers, hey, she's a foreigner. Don't touch her. She's under my protection. And then Ruth has an extremely profitable work day. Wouldn't you like to go to work one day and make a whole month's wages or two months' wages? That's like a dream come true. Here's this foreigner. Here's this poor widow. Here's this girl who's come from a foreign land. She's trying to take care of herself and her mother-in-law. She goes to work, and she can hardly carry all of the stuff that she's gleaned that day. She gets home, and Naomi is amazed. She can't believe it, and she says exactly what we say in our house when somebody comes home. Give me the details. Give me the details. Now, I have three daughters. And each one of them will tell their stories in different ways. I have one daughter, if you ask her how her day is, it's in real time. It will take all day to hear the story. <laughs> and then we have different variations of that. But we're all about the details. And Naomi says, give me the details. And Ruth drops this big detail. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz. Boom. And, and Naomi can't believe it. Now, do you remember Naomi from the end of chapter 1? Don't call me Naomi, which means pleasant. Don't call me that. Call me bitter. Call me Mara. My life is bitter. The Lord has afflicted me. What does she say in chapter 2? She sees Naomi. She sees God's great goodness and blessing, and she blesses God and Boaz twice in the process. She can't believe it because this new hope is creeping in. And she sees hope for a future. She saw God as her oppressor in the last chapter. And now here she sees God is stringing the beads of life together in a way that might have this hugely happy ending. And she's catching glimpses of that already in this chapter. Because she says, he's our close relative. He's our kinsman redeemer. And for a minute, we need to talk about that. The Hebrew word is goel. It's got two parts. It's a relative, and it's somebody who can come in and wipe out your debt or pay you or bring you out of slavery. And in the Old Testament, the kinsman redeemer had three major components, three major ways to help. The first one is in land. For instance, if you had a piece of land, and all Israelites had a piece of land in the promised land, and you ran into financial trouble, you might need to sell that land. The law said every 50 years there was something called jubilee where the land goes back to, to its original owner. But if you had been one of these people and you were in financial trouble and you had sold your land, if you had a close relative, he could come in and redeem that land and get it back for you early because you might not even make it to 50-year jubilee. Kinsman Redeemer help you with your land. Secondly is sometimes people sold themselves, the individual sold themselves into slavery. Or another way to look at it is kind of like uh, they became Mr. Bates in Downton Abbey. They had to hire themselves out because they, they had no other way to make money, so they had to be a servant. And a kinsman redeemer could come in and pay back the ransom and get you out of that scenario. The third way is if you were a widow and you had an unmarried brother or a close relative, they could come in and rescue this widow, and then the first son would get the name of the dead father so that the family name would live on. Let's look at a couple of scriptures that help us with this. Leviticus 25, if one of your countrymen becomes poor and sells some of his property, his nearest relative is to come and redeem what his countrymen has sold. Or in Deuteronomy 25, if brothers are living together and one of them dies without a son, his widow must not marry outside the family. Her husband's brother shall take her and marry her and fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to her. That's assuming, by the way, that the brother is unmarried. The first son she bears shall carry on the name of the dead brother so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. And see, the exciting connection here is that a willing redeemer could pay a debt. It was amazing if you had a willing redeemer. But see, we're going one step further in our story because a loving redeemer can change everything. 
And that's what we're going to see. And Ruth hears that Boaz is a kinsman redeemer. And she said, he even said to me, stay with my workers until they're finish harvesting the grain. You see, Ruth says, well, he, he asked me to stay. She's starting to get excited too. What's going to happen in chapter 3? You've got to come back next week. Because <laughs> chapter 3 is so exciting. You know, Boaz wanted Ruth to stay and work in his field. See, Jesus wants us to stay with him forever. Because Jesus is our Redeemer. In Romans 3, you read these words, the righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. You see, Christ pays our bill. Colossians 1, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. When he pays our sin debt, our sins go away and we're forgiven. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 says, For you know it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without, bless, without blemish or defect. The currency that was paid was Jesus' own life for you and me. That's how we get redemption. And see, what's illustrated by the people being baptized today is that they believe that and they accept that truth, that simple truth that Christ died for us. What about you? Jesus wants to be your Redeemer. Will you accept that? Because a loving Redeemer changes everything everything. Last text today, Titus 3, when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared. He saved us not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing and rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. Take it to the bank. You see, Ruth, if things work out with Ruth and Boaz, I don't want to, you know, hint on chapter 3, but if things work out, she's going to have this kinsman redeemer that changes her whole life. And we know at the end of the story that Jesus himself comes from the line that Ruth is connected with in the genealogy of Christ. It changes everything. Her whole life will change. If we accept Christ as our Redeemer, not only does this life change, but we have eternal life. That's our future hope. And it's a sure hope, just like the sun coming up tomorrow. Let me remind you of those three things again as we close. With God, there is no coincidence. You are loved by God no matter your condition. And lastly, Jesus wants to be your Redeemer. Will you accept that offer from him? Because it changes everything. Let's close in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for such an exciting day. Thank you for the whole group of folks that were baptized at this service and at the first service and will come again at the third. We're so excited that you're changing lives. We're so excited that... Not only do you provide a hope for our future, but you provide eternal life for us. Lord, we want to thank you for that. We want to put before you our town hall meetings on Tuesday and Wednesday this week because you have a hope for our church as well. We want to walk in that boldly and follow you. So would you be with us this week? Would you help us with our reputations? Would you help us to follow you closely this week because you are our Redeemer? And would you help us to see coincidence, not as just something that happens, but as your own hand at work in our lives. Thank you in Jesus' name.